Welcome to ChatGPP, a series of conversations with experts in generalized pustular psoriasis, known as GPP. My name is Yelena Misita, and I have two extraordinary people here today. One is Iris, a person living with GPP, a mother of three, and everything else that you will hear later. And Dr. Batia, Neil Batia from United States, who is an expert in dermatology and uh, this condition. So, Iris, Dr. Batia, pleasure to meet you. Will you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more uh, who you are and what is your journey so far? Hello, everyone. I'm Iris Chen Lai. I'm from Taiwan. I'm now 43, and I've been living with GPP since I was two. In the past 40 years, I've experienced more than 60 acute flares. Together with GPP, I entered medical school and completed medical training as a pediatrician and infectious disease specialist. Also, I became a working mom. I have three kids now, and I work in the children's hospital in Taiwan and also a primary care clinic. So hi, I'm Dr. Neil Bhatia. I'm a dermatologist in San Diego, California, in the United States. Uh, my primary focus of my career has been built on my knowledge of immunology and my work in immunology in the past. Uh, currently, I do uh, clinical research trials as well as see uh, regular patients as well as uh, do some other work in uh, advocacy with uh, dermatology as well as uh, serve as a consultant and investigator for Bering Ring Lyme. Thank you. Iris, uh, as a person living with this condition, what would you say, what's your most frequent challenge in day-to-day -day life and on daily basis? I would say, in a nutshell, is try to live as if I had no GPP. Because it's never easy to explain what I'm experiencing. Because it's a rare disease. If you say the name, others might just catch the psoriasis. But I doesn't look like psoriasis. Yeah, so basically, before I usually cover my skin, and uh, I try to keep it going, even though I'm having an acute flare. So I think this is the biggest challenge because too few people know about GPP. Dr. Bathia, is this correlating with the uh, healthcare professional side of things? When, from from your professional perspective, what what are the the, the main challenges of persons living with GPP? It is debilitating. The onset is very aggressive. The amount of erythema, the amount of, of pustular formation, can be very, in fact, scary to someone who's not familiar with the diagnosis. And we see this a lot in emergency rooms and non dermatology clinics where patients get treated with steroids or antibiotics or they think this may be a drug eruption, or something that actually delays not only the onset of uh, the you know most effective treatment, but also just questions the diagnosis over and over until the diagnosis is actually made successfully. So the, the bigger component of that is the patient's quality of life. I mean, there's significant amounts of pain involved in a flare, significant amounts of risk of infection. I would say 10 to 16% actually could die from the, the flare itself. So it's a, it's a very serious disease to uh, take on. What we try to do is avoid the terms like misdiagnosis and terms that sound negative and actually try to make the encouragement of uh, exploring the diagnosis more because it is such a rare condition, you know, presents itself very uncommonly, especially in the U.S. market, but when it does, it is very aggressive and very noticeable. So it's a strong learning tool for dermatologists to be aware of these conditions as well as for non-dermatologists to make sure that a dermatologist gets involved quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think from that standpoint, the institution of therapy uh, could be, the, the onset of it could be a lot quicker, which would bring some quality of life to the patients. You know, and, and the worst part, I think, and Dr. Lai would agree, is the, the, the time between flares is a very anxiety-provoking time. Nobody knows when that next flare is coming next. Patients are living in basically their own fear and their own jail mm -hmm. of the disease not knowing when is the next time things are going to get bad. And that's a very uncomfortable way to live. That really should be uh, something we can intercept. Yeah, that's it. 
Well, knowing that the presentation, the first presentation of the disease can be this dramatic, I can only imagine it wasn't that easy for your parents when it first uh, when you were first diagnosed, because you, as you said in the introduction, you were diagnosed practically as a baby, as a toddler. How do you think they got the news about your diagnosis and how was it explained to you later on? Well, my parents, actually, they have no medical ground. They are elementary school teachers and even my grandmother, basically, she can read. She is in, like illiterate, yeah. But they are like, Listen to what the doctor says and they cooperate with the doctors. The story doesn't start with all symptoms comes up. My first symptom is just a nail abscess, but I'm not responsive to any treatment. So even my nail was removed. But as like high fever, postures erupts everywhere. I was referred to the medical center, skin biopsy was done. And my parents were relieved at late time. Oh, finally, we know the diagnosis, but the more difficult one comes this no effective treatment and no effective prevention. And it took us three hour drive to the medical center. So actually, we gradually learned to home care. I had only been admitted for like three times, always in the first year after diagnosis. How challenging was it to, to get the treatment you needed when there was no direct treatment for the disease? So it's really hard for a patient and patient's family to accept, just like other chronic disease. Yeah. It seems you have to live with this disease for all your lifetime. And at least I was so little. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a big challenge to my parents, but they kind of, they are very, they have very party mindset. Yeah, they actually treat me like I'm, quite, I'm okay. They wouldn't stop me from doing anything. I'm now having a high fever. If I insist I want to go to school, they will just drive me to the school. I, I would say that's a good approach, you know, to live as normally as possible, uh, knowing the, the disease and no, knowing the diagnosis and also not knowing when the next flare will come. So I think that's that's actually a good strategy. And um, I, I've spoken with uh, with your colleague, Dr. Batia, uh, Batia prof professor from Italy recently, and he told me something that really resonated with me. He said, uh, we are... Um, we are teaching our uh, students, future doctors, that the first medicine that a patient receives is a doctor. A lot of things depend on how you speak with a patient, when he's scared, when he's, uh, he doesn't know what will happen next. Um, but even with these kind words, um, we need medicine. And now that we have effective treatments, what would you say, what's the, the biggest gap in uh, treatment of GPP? Well, first, I would definitely agree with that teaching mantra and sentiment. I mean, we teach our residents to make sure that we look patients right in the eye, to put your hands on them so they don't feel isolated or feel that they're dirty or sick or they've done something wrong, right? That, that just a little bit of healing hands makes a very big difference. But medicines have evolved based on the immunology that we've learned to understand. And as we've learned to understand the targets that are involved, uh, we've learned to actually make medicines that are more safe and more effective and more dedicated to the process. So if you take GPP, for example, compare it to regular psoriasis or re conventional plaque psoriasis, there are significantly more neutrophils, significantly more other cells involved that are not affected or not impactful as in regular plaque psoriasis. But I think it comes back to the beginning where we have to make that diagnosis first. Um, and I think, as Dr. Lai said too, the, the idea of, you know, where does the patient sit in terms of waiting for that next flare or what they've experienced, you know, that diagnosis has to be made not only, you know, somewhat quickly, but make it accurate so that the therapies that could actually be somewhat harmful are avoided. 
Speaking of diagnosis and being diagnosed, uh, are there effective guidelines uh, in this area? Are there enough guidelines for physicians in this area or there is yeah, something to be done? I guess the, part of the risks and benefit of guidelines is they're only as good as those who create them and only as good as those who follow them. Uh, generalized muscular psoriasis, unfortunately, doesn't follow the rules and it, it's linked to a differential diagnosis that, like I mentioned before, could be many different conditions that could actually lead a patient to a burn unit stay or other therapies versus the, you know, the overlap of conventional plaque psoriasis. You know, those treatment algorithms can be very conservative. And unfortunately, too, we're, we're living in a, an era where many of our smartest dermatologists are not comfortable enough with the prescribing or the institution of these therapies. And that's going to severely limit the patient success rates unless we get our own dermatologists well-trained and comfortable in the safety of these therapies. So that's a big push in, in the United States as well as in other markets in the world to make dermatologists realize this is their disease, these therapies are safe, and they, under right control, even with intravenous infusions, can be very safe you know, when used correctly. So I, I think that's really the direction we need to take our education to as well as teach our dermatologists in training. So would you say the fear of an unknown is, is preventing them from administering these therapies? or I think it's more a fear based on incomplete evidence in their own minds or stereotypes of things that they probably have not done their homework on. Uh, we see it a lot in our dermatology colleagues where they think they know the facts about a case, uh, facts about a therapy, and many times those facts are incorrect. Um, there's also, again, a trepidation of instituting biologic therapy based on you know perceived adverse events rather than actually considering the cost of not treating the patient who's in dire need. And I think that risk-benefit ratio needs to be really looked at carefully you know, by our dermatology colleagues because they may be missing out on treating patients like Iris early and effectively. The other risk with that is also the perception that intravenous infusions, for example, are not part of a dermatology clinic, which many of us disagree with. We, there are ways to institute a infusion pump into your clinic or what have you. And again, we, we look more at obstacles than we look at solutions, which I think is to the detriment of patients like Dr. Lai, who actually could, have, could benefit from early treatment and early intervention. So um, early treatment leads to better quality of life, better prognosis overall, and uh, it, uh, the, the, there is a, this double perspective. Um, expectations from medical side point are one thing, and but the other thing is what happens to a patient in real life. So when you think about your treatment and your patient journey, Iris, do you have any sort of, I don't know, mid-term, short-term, long-term goals in your treatment. What, what is your treatment goal? And do you talk about this with your dermatologist? How often do you talk about this? Mm, actually, most of the time. Yeah, but I think I benefit from, I personally is a physician too. So we kind of, we can talk like with some medical terms, even the immunology. Yeah, but... Uh, responding to Dr. Martil just talk about, I think patient was more cautious about the possible adverse event that a treatment can result. Also, patients have more fear about like if there's any adverse event or not, or can will I just have to be stick on to this treatment for my whole life? Will it increase my possibility of cancer or any other? Or if I continue my treatment, will someday I become unresponsive to this treatment anymore? I think that's the question deeply in all patients' mind, but they may not have time to ask or they may not dare to Ask. So here I have a question for the Dr. Bhatia. Uh, do you think from your experience, is it crucial to have collaboration with patient organization? Do you think your patient 
already asked you all the question in their mind. Is there anything or anywhere you want to convey to patient groups so that they speak to other patients? Mm -hmm. No, that's a pivotal part of making the education as well as the advocacy for patients, uh, not only with this disease, but many other rare diseases. Uh, we all work closely with the Academy of Dermatology or the American Academy of Dermatology as well as the National Psoriasis Foundation and those messages get translated to many other groups uh, as far as, again, not just making awareness, making you know, awareness of treatments, but also, again, the importance of regular um, advocacy for the patients who are not getting the care they need or the medicines they need. Uh, I think the key with GPP especially, again, you know, we mentioned guidelines. You know, guidelines are only as good as those who know what they're talking about, which is unfortunate. The, the other part of that is many of the guidelines are written by those who don't see patients. So those are two components of guidelines that we actually either eliminate or we just flat out ignore them because we need to learn from the science of those who can apply the immunology to the condition but also take the evidence from clinical research and put them into full-scale full you know, treatment of those who need it. And again, in the emergence of these treatments in different markets around the world, you know, more and more patients are going to get access to treatments that are dedicated to this disease and many others. I think part of the problem, again, not just going back to awareness, but the, the mindset of the physicians that are too risk-averse, thinking in terms of, you know, what are the risks of treatment, they have to go back to the benefits of treatment and think about the patients who are sitting with no quality of life, who are sitting at home waiting for the next flare how that affects the spouse, the parents, the, the children of these patients, the workforce, you know, impact of the patients who cannot work. So there are so many dynamics that are not even related to the medical side, but the quality of life side that patient advocacy groups can really work closely with, uh, with dermatologists as well as other physicians. I think the, the other real heart and soul of this, again, is the patient's voice. And we, we have that uh, patient voice on our our minds many times when we're talking about educational initiatives, going to the government, going to insurers about the you know, the need to make sure these treatments are accessible. But honestly, from a, a standpoint of of responsibility, it, it's our responsibility to keep these patients out of the emergency room, to keep them out of the hospital, because either they will not get the correct diagnosis and treatment, or there will be risk of you know, other issues that would, would be something we can avoid. So all of that is intertwined with, you know, the patient voice, the advocacy arms, all the organizations that work with these diseases as well as others. And again, getting to the heads of the dermatologists to say these are patients who desperately need treatment and we, and we have to get after them. Well, there is goodwill, obviously, on all sides to work together uh, from patient community to work with medical professionals, from medical professionals community to work with patients. But I have to play the devil's advocate here. It doesn't work like that quite often uh, in real life um, because for some reason, medicine is still, medicine is, is um, still very paternalistic and doctors don't see patients as partners and they see them as, um, pardon my expression, as treating subjects. You are to treat a patient, not to learn from a patient. So how do we change this? How do we pass this barrier? How do we really tap into what you're talking about? Because for now, it's just an idealistic vision. But in I can say in Europe, it's not working like this. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get an appointment to sit at the same table this is, for example, today a very exclusive opportunity to have a patient and a doctor talking outside of the doctor's office about this. And this is very, very important. So how do we overcome the barriers and how do patient associations get more credibility in talking when talking with medical professionals? Yeah, I mean, I think in the European market, especially as well as in Asia, you know, where government controlled healthcare, you know, limits access or the wait times are very long. The perception of an emergency is really variable to those who are allowing the, the gate to be open. Uh, many of those are a little bit different than the American market, where access to healthcare is not so limited, but can be limited for other reasons, economically or what have you. I, I think in the end, the, the awareness of the diseases that 
like GPP, for example, or that also could be potentially life threatening, they have to have some other mechanism besides, you know, a wait list or a, you know, banging on the doors as they let me in. And that's where you bring up the advocacy groups to create that awareness. And, you know, whether it be the simple photograph that's hanging in the clinic that says, if you see this, you know, treat this correctly versus any kind of webinars that are enduring or any kind of teaching program for the ancillary staff as well as the physicians. I mean, there can be so many different levels that can be reached, but as you said, it's difficult. And the, the physicians themselves have to be made aware of the risks of not treating and the costs of not treating. And I, I think that's a, a theme that could actually open more doors than, uh, than otherwise. I have some idea for the patient organizations. And also, uh, as a patient, I would say, or the physician can think, patient live with the disease 24 hours a day. So they must know something a physician didn't know. And uh, to the patients, you can think that a physician, especially a specialist, he or she see many patients, and we also know everyone's disease cause is very variable. So the physician must know something. We as patient, we didn't know. So it would be better that we can work together. And for patient group, I think it's good if we can prepare both physician and patients a good environment. I think everybody have to learn something in advance because especially in Asia, uh, before some patient will just look into the doctors. They will think, oh, if I just listen to a doctor, I will be cured. But for GBP, not it. Uh, we have to learn how to live with it. And if we trust our physician, that this must be based on very good relationship together, we can just live a better life. We are often told in the medical school, we have to see this patient as a whole, because if you don't know, it's gonna take an hour to put all the ointment over the body. You will just think, why your compliance is so bad? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're seeing this more and more in, in the US market with the use of diaries for a discussion of quality of life, of you know the amount of sleep loss, the amount of itching, pain, and all the other components of a disease, not just the, the visible or the, the physical findings that the patient presents with, but the whole story. And <clears throat> some of that, again, it, it takes the time of the physician to look patients in the eye, talk to their family about what's happening at home, yeah. all the other parts of quality of life that, again, as you mentioned before, just looking at patients as subjects in fact, in clinical research, looking at them as subjects is probably healthier than looking at them as patients because you come in with all subsets of data and that objective data is actually more helpful sometimes than the patients who don't tell the story. So there's, there's actually a bigger movement towards using patient diaries and patient outcomes uh, for the benefit of you know the whole rounded uh, package of what needs to be treated for the patient. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is, is gaining more and more interest. It, but just, again, it takes time. Um, and a lot of physicians, you know, when they're asked to see, a, you know, X number of patients in a day, they may not have the time to, or the resources to, to take that into account. So if we do see that in clinical research. Uh, we may need to see more of that in everyday practice. And for patient group, I think if in the patient gathering, Patients are not complaining about why doctors listen to us. Maybe we can share. Actually, you can talk to the doctor about how your life changed under current treatment and what's your expectation. Yeah, it would be more beneficial if a patient group can talk their members into talking about their life with physician. And again, physicians have to think patient's life quality is very important thing. Not just 
posture is gone, it's okay. No, maybe. And that goes uh, that goes along not just with the disease, but with the treatment. And you know, like you mentioned before about you know having to take the time to put all the ointments on or all the moisturizers or everything else on. But patients come in with a, a fear of injections or a fear of tablets or a fear of long-term treatments. Yeah. And it's the alleviation of those fears that has to take place quickly. Otherwise, you know, and even, the, the, again, the parents or the, you know, the spouses come in and they may take away the opportunity for treatment because of their concerns. So all of the attempt, even with advocacy groups and even with education there's still the phobias that patients have that have to be addressed. The fears of injections or intravenous treatments, the fears of taking tablets for whatever duration, that has to be worked with as well as the diagnosis itself and the, the mor comorbidities that go along with the diagnosis. Well, all this education that you mentioned, is this? would you consider it as a part of um, specific advanced uh, specific measures of uh, f for advancement for for improving uh, and enhancing gpp care and where do we go from there when you start from education where do you where do you continue who do you educate first i would say you still educate the the dermatologist first because they're the um they can be the voice uh, especially if they have the right tools and the right education and time I, I think that's where a lot of the gatekeeping starts with, again, not just the access to treatment, but the education of the disease state. But again, making patients aware of, of a disease they may not know that they had is a, a bit of a challenge because, the again, the amount of information they may get may actually create more fears than it does education. So there's a risk with that. The patient advocacy groups, however, are an important pipeline for bridging all the gaps between the physicians, the patients, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and many other sources of, of bureaucracy that, that all need to be working together. So I, I definitely think, you know, using, you know, again, we, we talk about the American Academy of Dermatology for patients. We talk about National Psoriasis Foundation, you know, working with patients, many other groups of coalition of rare diseases. All, all of them are very active in making sure the patient voice is heard, but I think that should come in the doctor's office as well, making sure the patient voice is heard when treatment access is denied or even worse, when the patient or the family is actually the, the source of, of uh, turning off the faucet. So I think there's a lot to, to be considered there. So communication and educational side, what would you say, Dr. Bathia, from GPP community, medical community, um, side of things, what would be, I don't know, primary goals in advancing this? Yeah, I think it, advancing treatment starts with advancing awareness of the diagnosis. We don't have to get into interleukin-36 or all the other cell lines, but we can definitely talk about how the immune system is actually something that can be, you know, worked with to make sure the disease state is quiet or quiet between flares. So simpler language, you know, can be helpful, but I think also making sure that uh, the patients and their families are aware of the significant, uh, and how, I'm sorry, how significantly debilitating this disease can be. Iris, as a person living with this disease, what do you see as a future for GPP care for patients? What do patients need the most, and how do you see this future will roll out? For me, I think maybe the physician, the dermatologist could become a bridge between a newly diagnosed GPP patient to a patient group. Yeah, because actually I have known a newly diagnosed eight-year patients, but I say, I say to the dermatologist, we are acquaintance that Oh, if you need or the parents want, actually, I can share with them my personal experience. But uh, finally, you know, the parents doesn't want. But what I want to say is, it really would be beneficial if a newly diagnosed patient could 
have some summarized correct knowledge from the patient group. That would be very important because they won't just lose follow up to try all others, then finally come back in a very bad condition. Well, uh, Europso, the, organ- the organization that I'm working for, is a European um, federation of uh, psoriasis organizations, and we did a series of workshops last year. As a matter of fact, we came to the same conclusion that you now mentioned. You see this as a future, we also see, see this as a future measure to make um, tailor-made patient information booklets, leaflets, that would help not only patients, but if patients is, is too young or for some reason cannot understand uh, this, even though it, it would be in layperson's language, we would like to have this prepared and available and authorized also by healthcare professionals so that we make sure these information are medically correct, but um, accessible for everyone who also didn't finish any medical school. Dr. Bathia, what do you think is, what do you see as a, as a future of GPP care from all of things that we discussed today? What, what will the future look like five years, 10 years from now? Yeah. I think uh, we're, we're heading for a, a much brighter future than in days past, especially when Dr. Lai was young and got diagnosed uh, after some time and some effort, I think the the effort will be less. the The time to make a diagnosis will be less, and that should allow for patients to be uh, getting better access to treatments. As we see some of the uh, clinical research data for therapies that are, are currently in research trials, uh, we're going to see more and more potential to intercept these patients' uh, flares, as well as keep them from having flares. And, and again, we use the term uh, "turn off the faucet." Rather than mopping up the mess, by turning off the faucet, we're targeting the, you know, specific proteins that are working, rather than again chasing, you know, the inflammation with steroids and other medicines that really are not dedicated to this disease state. I think for even more so as as we talk about advocacy and as we talk about patient access, more and more patient voices will be heard, and more and more access to care would probably be eligible. So I think there's a lot of good opportunity for us. It just starts again with with the basics of making the diagnosis early and and reducing the flares between treatment to keep quality of life up. So in a nutshell, you believe that having standardized diagnostic and treatment protocols will improve future GPP care, right? I, I think there's a difference between standardized and a template. And I think a template for treatment is probably better because it will allow... Uh, the art of medicine uh, to mix in with the science. Because once we start being told what to do, uh, most dermatologists will say, no, no I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, it's a human nature, I of think. Of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you both. Uh, this, was, this was amazing. Thank you for your insights and all the useful information we got today. And uh, would you like to have, say something as, a, as an inspirational message to patients who are now maybe watching us? I'll just say very quickly, I think the future is very bright. And I think it's up to us now to utilize the tools that we have and uh, make patients' lives a little easier. Okay, to anyone who is watching, I want to say to you that I know it's never easy to live with GPP, but I think we should remember that many on this world are working hard for us, even in the laboratory or in the clinic or your family, your friends. So I think the future is positive and bright. So let's try to keep going brightly. I want to say thank you, Iris, for your honesty and courage. And doc- thank you, Dr. Bathia, for your all insights that you shared with us. And thank you at home for tuning in for the chat GPP session. I hope you learned a lot from today's conversation. And I hope you we inspired you to fight your uh, battle more courageously. Uh, because Dr. Bathia said, the future is bright. Thank you. Mm-hmm.